This is a lecture for question seven, which has three parts. First, what two sentiments does the desire to punish someone come from? Second, what makes human beings different from animals in this context? And third, what are the two tests of whether a punishment is just or not? Now, the desire to punish someone who's done harm to someone else comes from two feelings, two sentiments for Mill. And this is found on page 51, near the middle of the page. The, the two sentiments are the impulse of self-defense and the feeling of sympathy. Now this leads us, quote, to repel or retaliate any harm done or attempted against ourselves or against those with whom we sympathize, end quote. That quotation encapsulates both self-defense and sympathy. We retaliate when someone harms us or attempts to harm us. This applies not just to ourselves as individuals, but everyone and everything we feel sympathy with. What Mill means, as I mentioned last time by sympathy here, is not feeling sorry for a person or another animal. It's more like a feeling of connectedness, like when they get hurt, we feel it too, and when they're happy, we feel it too. We retaliate, in other words, against people who threaten us, and we interpret ourselves to include everyone and everything we feel connected to. Now note, Mill thinks that so far this description fits not just human beings, but all other animals as well. Almost all animals defend their young, and often they will defend their entire group, like a pride of lions, a pack of wolves, a pod of dolphins. Other animals can be trained to expand their conception of themselves. Dogs can easily be trained to protect humans, for example. Mill interprets this as the dog seeing the human as part of itself, so that when it's in a situation where the human needs to be defended, the, dogs, the dog acts like it is defending the human as part of itself. The dog feels sympathy for the human the way it would for its own young. So far, so good. The human desire to punish comes from a natural source that we have in common with other animals. We are on a natural continuum of self-defense and sympathy. Now for the second part of the question. What makes humans different from other animals when it comes to punishment? Both of them have to do with a feeling of sympathy or connectedness. Both of them are toward the bottom of page 51. Human beings are capable of sympathizing with all other human beings related to us by blood or not. Indeed, we can sympathize with all sentient beings, human or not. Sentient means an animal is capable of perceiving and feeling things. So we can sympathize with all kinds of animals, not just other mammals, but even reptiles and insects. We can feel sorry for ants if their anthill is destroyed and we see them still trying to get home. So the overall principle is actually human beings are capable of sympathizing with all sentient beings whatsoever. This is one factor that makes us different from other animals. Human beings' intelligence makes us able to see that we are part of a community of interest that includes the entire human community and beyond. We can think of the collective interests of humanity, the common good of all. A contemporary example would be environmental consciousness, where we think not just of human interests, but of the interests of all life on Earth, human or not, in the survival of the planet as a home for living beings. I'll say this one more time in different terms in case anyone is struggling with it. Human beings differ from other animals in two connected ways. One, we are able to sympathize with all sentient beings. Two, we are capable of stepping so far outside our individual interests that we can perceive how our interests are connected to the common good of all of humanity or even of all living things. Now the last part of question seven is easy to talk about. Mill makes Mill makes two points about just or ethical punishment at the middle of page 57. These two points are, first, that a punishment to be right must be proportioned to the offense. 
This means that the more severe punishments should be reserved for very serious crimes, and that there should be some reasonable way of relating the seriousness of the crime to the punishment. Think of the practice in the so-called Islamic State of cutting off someone's hands when they steal. Although there may be a certain grim logic to it, it's certainly disproportionate. Someone who steals a banana from a fruit stand has taken away a few pennies worth of profit from the fruit seller. Someone whose hands are severed is no longer able to live a normal life in all kinds of ways. Mill's second point about ethical punishment is that it must only be harsh enough to actually deter the crime. So, for example, I got a ticket a few years ago for running a red light. Well, the light was still in the process of turning red when I drove under it. Anyway, I got caught. The punishment amounted to about $500 plus traffic school. I didn't like paying the $500, and I really didn't like wasting my time on traffic school. Even the online one is deeply annoying. The punishment has made me very careful about not running those dark, dark orange lights. It was, for me at least, a sufficient deterrent. Taking away my driver's license would have been a disproportionate punishment since $500 plus traffic school worked just fine on me as a deterrent. So at least I didn't need to be punished more than this. I don't know about other people. Anything less than this might not have been a sufficient deterrent. Say, just $500 without traffic school, and I might say to myself, I can afford that every couple of years. Even if it was just traffic school, I could easily forget how annoying that was and not be deterred from running those lights again. The combination of the cash penalty and the traffic school was just the right amount for me. It was proportionate to the crime. One more time, to be just or ethical, a punishment must be, one, proportionate to the crime, and two, only harsh enough to deter other people from committing the crime or to deter the perpetrator from doing it again. That's it for question seven. Take a break, have a cup of coffee, text your friend about how much you're enjoying the ethics videos, and when you're ready, come back and view the next one, which is about question eight, the ethics of different systems of collecting taxes. It's more interesting than you think.